studios in Belize City, this is Love Television with your evening news for today, Tuesday, May 24th. We'll get started with the leading stories for today. <music> Cabinet revokes statutory instrument prohibiting movement on the SARS student. Government says move comes after successful talks in Istanbul, Turkey. Deputy CARICOM Secretary General on working visit to Belize. Former government minister and father of the leader of the opposition dies. National Griffin Council elects new executive at annual convention and U.S. court has confirmed an arbitral award made against the government of Belize. Bilateral talks between Belize and Guatemala began yesterday in Istanbul, Turkey with delegations from Belize, Guatemala, and the Organization of American States. For Belize's part, Foreign Minister Wilfred Elrington led the delegation, while Car Carlos Raul Morales represented Guatemala and Magdalena Talamas represented the Secretary General of the Organization of American States. The meetings coincide with the World Humanitarian Summit being held by the United Nations Secretary General in that transcontinental nation. The government of Belize sent out a press release earlier today stating that both countries have once again expressed their desire for peaceful talks and discussions over the ongoing differendum. The release went on to state, quote, The ministers recognize the need to avoid incidents between the two countries that affect the process of confidence building as agreed in 2000, 2003 and 2005. In this context, they affirmed the need to work more in the development of building confidence, especially between the armed forces of both countries, including the possibility of having joint training for the troops responsible for patrolling the adjacency zone. Both ministers recognized the urgent need for and committed to working on the design and development of a mechanism for cooperation in the Sarstu River, which should include the participation of relevant, re relevant institutions of both parties, and be coordinated by foreign ministers and ministries with the participation of the Organization of American States. Recognizing the importance of the OAS office in the adjacency zone and of the urgent and critical need for funding to maintain this office, they undertook to jointly pursue efforts to source such funding." End of quote. Within minutes of receiving this release from the government's press office, another correspondence came in announcing the revocation of the statutory instrument that bans Belizeans from entering the Sarstun River. That two-paragraph release says that the cabinet has requested that the Governor General, His Excellency Sir Colville Young, sign a statutory instrument revoking, with immediate effect, the Sarstun Prohibition SI. The request comes on the heels of the meetings in Istanbul where an agreement was reached regarding the Sarstun. The agreement, according to the release, is a commitment from both sides to begin working on a formal cooperation mechanism that will respect Belize's and Guatemala's respective use and navigation of the Sarstun River. While the formal mechanism is being worked on, the two sides have informally accepted a situation in which there will be untrammeled traffic for Belize's military and civilians along the Sarstun. The meetings in Istanbul were held at the Met and Hilton Bomonti Hotel. Belize's delegation headed by Minister Elrington included Ambassador Alexis Rosado and the representative for the opposition party, Senator Eamon Courtney. While the top foreign affairs officials from both Belize and Guatemala were making their way to Turkey for these bilateral meetings, a handful of Belizeans had ventured out onto the Sars Tune on Sunday. Head of the Belize Territorial Volunteers, Will Mejia, led that small group including Bobby Lopez of the Belize Progressive Party. According to Mejia, the military presence and aggression had tremendously eased at the SARS tune. We continue to believe that we should not be restricted in moving um, within the country. And, um, you know, so far for the past, since they signed it, they said we can go beyond Barranco, so we continue to push it. Today, um, today, I don't know if we were just lucky or something, but yesterday there was over a hundred military people in town. Today, while like, seems like all of them cleared out, we just put the boats in the water and pushed out. We went, we went by Barranco, there was not even a military person, um, no coast guard, no, um, BDS. And we drove all the way to the mouth of the river. When we got to the mouth of the river, we decided, you know what, it's only four more days, um, let's not break the, Glad that we don't agree with anyhow. Um, plus the seizure was rough and everything. 
So we decided, look, let's just let let let's just uh, hold on for next few days until the 27th or 28th when the law, uh, when the SI expired. But you know, today was uneventful. We went there clearly. Um, no BDF, no police, no Coast Guard boat, nothing. We just we could have gone right all the way. What we were surprised was about was the fact that we did not see a BDF boat at the forward operating gate. Maybe it was there and we didn't get close enough to see it, but we didn't see any. As you heard, there was an influx of law enforcement officers in Toledo on Saturday, and it is suspected that that was in preparation of the expedition that the People's United Party had planned, as Mejia told Love News. Clearly, clearly, they, um, they came here to block the PUP. Um, unfortunately, the PUP did not show up. Um, but clearly, there was like, I counted at least six military boats, BDF and Coast Guard, CBF, three Coast Guard, um, and hundreds of policemen or, or special police units or people who work in the enforcement agency in the government. So um, that was, you know, I mean, they were here for that. Last night, I guess they pulled out. This morning, we put our boat in. We went south and not even a police to ask us where we were going. The PUP expedition, however, never occurred as late Friday night it was called off on the grounds that the boat owners were reportedly being intimidated and subsequently had feared that their boats would be confiscated. The other reason given by some within the party was that the mission was called off since John Brasenio's father was critically ill. Mejia spoke to the cancellation of the trip by the PUP. Um, as far as, you know, them not making the trip, I understand it, it is a situation where, um, John, I definitely understand John's situation, but, you know, lots of people around town be talking, well, there is a deputy and there are other people. We, people would have understand if, um, the leader didn't make it, but there are other people. And as far as boat is concerned, it appears to have enough members with a lot of boats, so that's, no excuse. But anyhow, at the end of the day, a lot of people were disappointed that they did not make the trip because a lot of people showed up hoping to at least see them making the trip, you know? So uh, that was very disappointing to a lot of people. As we reported earlier, the statutory instrument is looking to be rescinded and there will be free movement in the Sarstoon. But aside from that, free movement and the formal agreement that the two countries are looking to formulate, there are other ends that remain out there. Primarily the public campaign to boycott all products and services by and from Guatemala. It is a campaign that has taken on a life of its own as vendors in the neighboring Paten, Guatemala are protesting to their government since they have been losing revenue due to the boycotting efforts by Belizeans. As is a tradition of sorts, the mechanical rides are in Belize from Guatemala, and there is a campaign to not support these rides whilst explaining to the children the rationale behind not taking them out to the hour bar field. Jose Luis Uc Espat was part of two man show on Saturday, holding up placards appealing to Belizeans not to go on the rides. Love News met up with him over the weekend. I'm out here because it's inconceivable. inconceivable. How, how come? Our mayor, our government, will concede the concessions and the permissions to the Guatemalan companies that bring these rides to our country, given our economic and financial state that this country is in at the moment, given the situation with the, the continuous aggression on behalf of Guatemala, uh, and Belize has never set foot on Guatemalan ground, you know, but it's a bigger picture. It's a bigger picture that the Belizean citizenry needs to understand, you know. We need, uh, the, the, the power of our money is, is something that we have yet to understand, okay. Right now, in Peten and in Melchor, they are feeling, because Belizeans are no longer going to buy. Tomorrow, as, as I, I speak here, I understand that tomorrow there will be a, a, a they will station a march in, in Melchor against their own Guatemalan government because the Belizeans are no longer purchasing and they are feeling the crumb. And I try to reach out to every single Belizean out there. Please support the boycott against Guatemala. We need to let these people understand that we are no pushover. 
In recent conversations with some Belizeans, Love News was told that with the new school year coming up, they will be opting to purchase uniform material in Belize City and have them sewn by local seamstresses. This will reflect a major economic blow for businesses like Little Melchor and the other stores that carry the Guatemalan manufactured uniforms. Meanwhile, on social media, there is a page that lists several products imported from Guatemala coupled with an appeal to not buy them. Deputy Secretary General of CARICOM Ambassador Manorma P. Soknandan, PhD, is on a three-day working visit to Belize. During that time, Dr. Soknandan will be meeting with officials of the government of Belize as well as representatives of the various CARICOM institutions headquartered in Belize. Earlier today, Dr. Soknandan visited the OAS office in the adjacency zone where she was briefed on the latest development taking place in the adjacency zone between Belize and Guatemala. At the 19th meeting of the Council of Foreign and Community Relations, COFCOR, CARICOM foreign ministers emphasized their resolute support for the sovereignty, territorial integrity and security of Belize. Dr. Soknandan leaves Belize on Thursday. Belize's debt is at the highest it has ever been and with the final ruling imminent regarding the nationalization of Belize Telemedia Limited, it will go even higher. Today, however, there is more to add to the country's debt as a U.S. court has confirmed an arbitral award made against the government of Belize. It is a case that surfaced in 2002 under the Musa administration, whereby an agreement was signed with Nuco Company, an affiliate of the Lufthansa airline. The then government had entered into an agreement to give Nuco a 30-year concession for the private management of the Philip Colton International Airport, and in 2005, the PUP administration cancelled that agreement and gave it to the Belize Airport Concessions Company. As a result, Nuco filed a lawsuit to the tune of 33 million U.S. dollars in January of 2008, which they say is for damages caused when they backed out of the deal. The international arbitrators in June 2008 ruled against the government of Belize and ordered them to pay 2.6 million U.S. dollars in damage, plus other, another 1 million U.S. dollars in interest and another 500,000 U.S. dollars in other costs. It rounded up to about 9 million Belize dollars. The ruling came just when the Barrow administration had taken over and so they were left with the burden of having to pay that award. Interestingly, what was noted back in 2008 was that the Musa administration had granted the Belize Airport Concession Company indemnity, meaning that if the arbitration was to result in any award against them, that the government of Belize would foot the bill. By January 2009, Nuco got tired of waiting for its money, and they initiated civil action in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia to enforce the award and, in addition, had filed legal actions in the countries where Belize has its major trading and finance relations. The delay in the payment to Nuco was mainly due to the government of Belize wanting to work out terms for payment, while Nuco was demanding full payment and as well as there was an issue as to when the penalty interest began occurring. Belize had managed to secure an injunction in the Belize courts on the grounds that they needed a declaration regarding the start of the interest penalty phase and also there was a request to pay the award in Belize dollars since Nuco is a locally registered company and, and as well there was the issue of outstanding taxes by Nuco to the government of Belize amounting to $2.7 million. The Belize Supreme Court ultimately agreed that the government could subtract the unpaid taxes from the award and the balance could be paid in Belize dollars. Nuco refused those conditions and as a result, they continued their efforts in seeking enforcement for the arbitral award in the district court while Belize moved to dismiss the suit on a variety of grounds. It is a drawn-out case which is undoubtedly costing the government. According to the judgment document from the United States Court of Appeals dated May 13, 2016, it reads in part, quote, We affirm under the Federal Arbitration Act, U.S. courts must enforce foreign arbitral awards unless they find one of the grounds for refusal or deferral of recognition or enforcement of the award specified in. The United Nations Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, also known as the New York Convention. It goes on to say, quote, we have carefully considered all of Belize's arguments. We affirm the judgment of the district court. End of quote. 
as it relates to the New York Convention, Belize is a signatory and as such this award is enforceable, not just in Belize, but in this jurisdiction of any of the parties to that convention. We have been unable to get a comment from Financial Secretary Joseph Waite. The gravity of the issue surrounding offshore banking and the effects it has had on the banking sector was not given much attention back in July 2014 when Belize was in the international news following the launch of an investigation into Sync Technology, a company that had falsely stated its address to be inside the Matalon building in Belize City. Attention was drawn to Sync Technology when its stocks began soaring rapidly, going from $0.10 cents in June and increasing to $20 one month later. The initial conclusion that it was a pump-and-dump scheme proved true in a U.S. court. A pump-and-dump scheme referring to when the value of stocks are artificially inflated by insiders and then dumped once money is made off of the stocks. The court case wrapped up when a U.S. citizen who was residing in Belize at the time of his arrest pled guilty in a Brooklyn federal court yesterday to conspiring to launder $250 million in proceeds from securities fraud. This is a major victory for those investigating money laundering cases since it is the biggest conviction so far when it comes to businesses hiding money offshore. 71-year-old Robert Banfield was a dentist with a practice in Canada before moving to Belize. He was arrested at a Miami airport in September 2014 and has been in the custody of the U.S. authorities since. Banfield was being accused of incorporating more than 5,000 shell companies in Belize and the West Indies and laundering money through prepaid debit cards. And in an article published by the Wall Street Journal, it stated, quote, Prosecutors say Mr. Banfield, a U.S. citizen who operated a group of companies in Belize, was the architect of a scheme that allowed his clients to secretly manipulate U.S. stock prices, launder their illegal proceeds back to the U.S. and evade taxes. As part of the scheme, Mr. Banfield created more than 5,000 shell companies in Belize and the West Indies to hide from the U.S. government his clients' stock ownership and ill-gotten proceeds, according to prosecutors. End of quote. Banfield is set to be sentenced on September 1, 2016 and faces up to 20 years in prison. He has agreed to forfeit $1 million. Two other individuals charged with him have pleaded guilty and the rest remain as fugitives. Last week when we brought you an interview with the leader of the opposition, John Bresenio, he was standing outside the Buttonwood Bay Clinic in Belize City where his father was being treated. His father had become frail in the last weeks after suffering from cardiac complications. On his Facebook page, John Bresenio wrote on Saturday evening, quote, Please pray for my dad, that God welcomes him into his arms. My dad has lived a good life and we are grateful, but we all have to take this final journey. He is coming to the end. Some eight and a half hours later, the PUP party leader updated his page saying, quote, My father is now at rest in the arms of our Lord. He passed away at midnight. I am very grateful for the life he gave my family and I, and to the service he gave to his country, Belize. End of quote. And serve he did to this country. 78-year-old Eligio Bresenio served not only the people of Orange Walk, but the entire country. It was under his ministry that the social security movement came about. He had served as the chairman of the Belize Sugarcane Farmers Association and was crucial in working with football athletes in Orange Walk and getting the works done at the People's Stadium. Brisenio, or Don Joe, as he was affectionately called, had also provided house lots for dozens of families in the Louisiana area and others. Brisenio worked as a teacher in several villages. He served on the Orange Walk Town Council and contributed greatly to the sport of horse racing. He was a government minister in the areas of energy and communications. When asked to describe Don Joe Brisenio, his political colleague, Don Hector Silva, told Love News that the first thing that came to mind was humility. Eligio actually was a member of the House of Representatives. He took over from his older brother, who was Toro Bresenio, also a member of the House. Toro was the older brother. He was a representative before Joe. Then Joe was elected to the House in that same constituency that he still know how sorry about four, five, six times. Joe was a very humble, very quiet young man. I knew him from St. John's College. He was my junior, of course, but he was a student at St. John's. That's where I get to know him. Um, he was a very quiet young man, you know, Joe. Polo was more outgoing, you know, the older brother. 
But you must have this a very quiet humble young man. Um, and I knew him you now, I used to meet him all the time. So actually, Joe has done a great job. He has done actually good service to his country. And for that, I think the nation should be true. Because these are the men that actually were the ones that partook in the movement of independence. He is one of those that stood to seek at the struggle of independence would go forward to Christianhood as what we have now. So I always call them, you know, Mr. President, to call them soldiers of the constructive Belizean revolution. And Joe is one of those. I admire him very much, you know. The People's United Party has issued a release saying, quote, the People's United Party would like to assure the Bresenio family that they can find comfort in knowing that they are not alone in their grief. People from inside and outside of the party have known that the generosity and goodness of this man. Don Joe was a source of towering strength to his family and a giant figure in the Orange Walk community. He was always such a fantastic cheerleader and trusted advisor for a party leader. And though he had been ill for some time now and his feet eventually got tired, his huge heart never wavered. He worked long and hard for his family, his community and his country. And now his work is done, his soul is at rest. End of quote. The government of Belize has announced that Brisenia will have an official funeral on Wednesday, May 25th at La Immaculata Church in Orange Walk Town. Eligio Brisenio is survived by seven sons and three daughters. A wake is scheduled for tonight at his home. The National Griffin Council has a new executive during the 32nd annual NGC convention in Libertad Village in the Corazon District. Sandra Miranda was elected as president. Other members of the executive are Vice President Hazel Cayetano, Second Vice President Stanislas Martinez, Secretary Dr. Ethel Arzu, Assistant Secretary Marcia Mejia, Treasurer Marietta Enriquez, and Assistant Treasurer Oscar Marcelo. This year's convention focused on Garifuna spirituality and matters affecting Garanagu, such as land issues, economic stability, and the impact of crime on youth. The 2017 convention is scheduled to take place in Belize City. A convention to elect the new first deputy party leader of the United Democratic Party will take place this Sunday. The two men contesting to fill the post, Minister of Education Patrick Faber and Minister of National Security John Saldiva, have been on a campaign to woo the almost 500 delegates. The two men were in the Stan Creek District yesterday. Faber took his campaign to Hopkins Village, while Saldiva was in Dangriga, where correspondent Harry Arzu caught up with him. Minister of Education Honorable Patrick Faber and Minister of National Security Honorable John Saldiva are the two candidates who are contesting for the deputy party leader position in the United Democratic Party in the upcoming convention that is slated for this Sunday. In addition, Saldiver, along with some senior ministers and party supporters, met here in Dangriga yesterday where they addressed a number of delegates. Love News spoke with Saldiver. This is our final stop on the uh, countrywide tour that covers the southern part of Belize and I'm so happy with the turnout here today. From the south as well as from all the other parts of the country, we had quite a few hundred delegates here. It's an indication of how we will do on May 29th. I'm very confident of the victory. Uh, we, we have the 80% of the cabinet on my side. We also have over 70% of the, of the entire uh, delegates list. So I feel very confident about what will happen on May 29th. The people want to see our party continue with the progress. They want to see our party remain united. And I think that is what the, the vote is going to be about on May 29th. Reporting for Love News from Dangriga, I'm Harry Arzu. A fiber cable break in Belmopan this morning caused the interruption of 4G internet network around the vicinities of the U.S. Embassy and the British High Commission. Public relations for the Belize Telecommunications Limited, Ronisha Gentle, told Love News the company is doing everything to restore the network by 9 o'clock tonight. In the wee hours of Saturday morning, San Ignacio police were called out to the area of the low-lying bridge in that municipality following a traffic incident. Reports are that police responded to Savannah Street just after 4 o'clock where they found a blue Toyota Corolla sedan with extensive damages near the wall of the market. Trapped 
Inside the vehicle was a man later identified as 34-year-old Patrick Gordon and a 23-year-old woman, Gardena Tech, who was seated on the passenger side. Gordon was reportedly unconscious while the woman was in serious pain and crying for help. Preliminary investigations says that Gordon was coming from Santa Elena into San Ignacio town when he lost control of the vehicle as he crossed the wooden bridge and as a result, he slammed into the concrete wall of the market. The vehicle received extensive damages to its entire front portion and to the windshield. With the assistance of the fire department, both persons were removed and transported to the San Ignacio Community Hospital for medical attention. Tech suffered a broken right leg and a broken left wrist while Patrick received a cut wound on his left kneecap and had complaints of pain all over his body. According to police, both persons are believed to have been under the influence of alcohol. Medical forms were issued and a blood sample was requested from Gordon, a request which he has refused to comply with. What should have been a peaceful fishing trip among friends ended up in the untimely death of an August Pine Ridge teacher at the Lamanai Lagoon this past Sunday. Three men went fishing aboard a canoe and it overturned. While two of the men managed to swim ashore, the third 39-year-old Bartolo Torres was not so lucky. Over the weekend, family and friends along with the Belize Coast Guard searched for the body. This morning at around 4.30, that body was found. Deputy officer in charge of the Orange Walk Police Station, Inspector Nicholas Palomo, tells what happened on the fateful trip. Hey, hey guys, we went fishing at the La Manuel Lagoon in um, San Carlos area. I think we were fishing. One of them, two of them are called guys, and the third one is Abartolo Torres. About 10 miles southwest of San Carlos, it looked like the wheel. Was, was too, uh, too high and they overturned the story that they were in. And the, the, the two Coast Guard guys managed to swim to the, to the lagoon shore and the third guy got down and they didn't restore rest till this morning. This happened on um, Sunday. What happened Sunday, 11.45. A post mortem was conducted in the area of San Carlos in the Orange Walk district. Belize's music ambassador, Shine Po Barrow, has received much flack after he was given the post by his father, Dean Barrow. He was, however, he has, however, come a long way as he has been showing off efforts in building on the local musical talent via classes, working groups, among other initiatives. But while he has been working on the local level, he has kept in contact with music colleagues in the United States. And over the weekend, there was a Bad Boys reunion concert at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York. Shine performed one of his old hits and had the video shoot done on a Maya temple in Belize. He received much fanfare for his performance on Friday night. Other performers at the reunion concert were Puff Daddy, Faith Evans, Marion Winnens, Jay-Z and Mary J. Blige. The concert was held to commemorate the 44th birthday of Notorious B.I.G. Stay tuned to our newscast as we will close off with Shine's performance at the Barclays Center. The Police United Football Club will be representing Belize in the upcoming CONCACAF Champions of Champions League. This is the first time that a police team has qualified to enter the competition. Club manager, Senior Superintendent Andres McKinn, spoke about the upcoming trip for the selection of matches. We traveling to Miami. The technical team, along with myself, the manager, will be traveling to Miami to do the, the pick, the lot of pick as to who we're going to be playing against for the Champions League. No? Um, that will be held on Monday in Miami at 5 p.m. I think it's going to also be broadcast live on Fox Sport, I believe, because um, they have the exclusive ex exclusivity over the Champions League. No? So um, Monday the draw will be, will be made, no? so we'll be there for, for that draw. A senior superintendent, McKinn, said they qualify to the competition after defeating the Belmopan Bandits. You guys who have been following the game of soccer in Belize, um, um, I believe that you would have known that we uh, started in the PLB since 2011, the Police United Football Club. And since then we've um, <clears throat> came a long way. Um, we've won two championships and we've, became, we've been um, sub-champions for like six, um, four times. So for the six or so tournaments that we've um, been a part of the PLB, we have um, always been um, at the finals 
and with two championships, well, this last championship has given us that right to represent Belize in the Champions League. Um, as um, for those who don't really follow the game, you know, Champions League has to do with the champions of, of, of countries now that um, represent their country at the end of two tournaments. A football tournament is a football year is a calendar is two tournaments for the for the year, and uh, we managed to win the first of this for for 2015 to 2016. We were the opening tournament champions. Um, what happened is that at the end of both tournaments. The champions are considered, but at the same time, if there's a tie, if there's, you know, if, if, if you're not back-to-back -back champions, then they have a point system that you go by. And what happened is that they put both tournaments points together, and then um, the one with the highest points would then be the ones to, 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 to gain the right to become um, the, con the CONCACAF for the Champions League representative of the country. As I said, if you guys have been following, we were the opening tournament champions, and then Bandits were the closing tournament champions. But what happened when they accumulated both tournaments points, we became we, we came out with 40 and they came out with 39 points. So that gave us the right to represent at the Champions League. For the team to be able to participate in the games, they would need about $200,000. Senior Superintendent McKin spoke to the media about funding. We have set a budget. We have already put a budget in place because um, we have done our inquiries and so forth. So we've come up with a budget um, but so far you know we, we're far from achieving what what, what, what what's the budget is but um, at the same time I must also say or reveal that in the Champions League you're also given a grant right from the from Champions League itself so we're looking around a hundred thousand Belize that will be granted to us likewise but that in itself will not take care of all the um, expenses that will be, under, will be under, undergoing so it, it goes a little beyond that and therefore um, um, we we're hoping that we could we could meet meet what they they will be giving us now, so it, it will run us around two hundred thousand to, to to play this the, the, these games. The team currently has twenty five players. Yoga instructor Shanti Garcia is starting a new yoga class catering for a specific group of people. The yoga class is geared for amputees. Basically tailored to people who are amputees and the idea is to get them to be fit, to get them to be well so that they can continue living on and maybe even overcome some of the challenges that they're facing. Consultation is necessary because each amputee will have different abilities, different challenges, different desires or needs and so through the consultation I'll be able to know what their needs are and what they can and cannot do in a yoga class so it's really going to be based on their needs and desires. Class is going to be based just like a group yoga class where we have a little bit of centering, we're going to do breathing and both of these techniques will help them to cope with different stresses in their life. We're going to do a variety of yoga poses that will improve their fitness, their health and their strength and we'll also incorporate relaxation. So the structure of the class is the same as normal yoga classes but the class is geared towards them so that they don't feel like they're different from everybody else and the other people in the class will be able to understand what they're going through and relate to their situation. Garcia states that she specifically tailored the prices to help assist with the financial burden that an amputation might cost free because I am aware that maybe some amputees might not be fitting for the program so I'm not charging for the consultation. It might take anywhere between half an hour to an hour and that's where I'm really going to assess each individual on what they can do or what they cannot do, how I'm going to modify the poses for them once they start the classes and stuff like that. Um, the classes once they do uh, qualify for the yoga classes. It's going to be uh, Tuesday, Thursdays, and Fridays right here at the studio, Airbender Yoga Studio, from 3.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. And if the person wants to try the class, because maybe they say they don't want to do yoga, that is fine. I cannot force them. But if they want to try yoga, then it's only $10 to try the class. And if they like the class and want to continue, then it's um, $60 for the month. And they pay a one-time $10 membership. Garcia shares the reason behind her desire to develop a yoga class for amputees a loved one who basically 
recently became an amputee and it's a life-changing experience and um, of course because that loved one is a family member basically you know he can get whatever treatment that I can provide for yoga and stuff like that but I thought of instead of just helping that loved one why don't I reach out and help other people too because it is a lot that you have to go through when you have a family member who is amputated and so um, I want to provide help for other people as well so that's how the idea came about. You can contact Ashanti Airbender Garcia at 620-4230 or on Facebook under Ashanti Garcia. 29-year-old Christoph Riverola, a former employee of Full Tech Systems who posted a hard drive he stole in the buy and sell column on Facebook, was spared a custodial sentence when he appeared today before Magistrate Carlon Mendoza and pled guilty to two counts of theft. Because he had no previous convictions for crimes of dishonesty and he had saved the court time by pleading guilty, Riverall was fined $1,000 for each count and he was given until September 30th to pay. If he defaults on payment, he will serve one year. Riverall had only been working at Full Tech Systems as a sales support representative for about three weeks when he stole the terabyte external hard drives. The human resources manager at Full Tech reported that she received certain information from her employer owner and general manager that an employee had posted one of their products on a Facebook page. She said that when she viewed the security camera, she saw Riverall taking the hard drives from the counter. One of the hard drives was recovered from Riverall and the others was recovered from a woman that he had sold it to. The Child Advisory Board in San Ignacio Town along with the Mayor and Town Council has begun an initiative to restore the parks in San Ignacio. Over the weekend, the two entities came together to visit the parks and develop plans for the restoration project. Vanessa Neal, a town councillor in San Ignacio, spoke about this initiative. The Child Advisory Board decided to set today the 22nd of May um, as a day to visit a few, and I will say a few because we have a lot of parks and playgrounds in um, the Twin Towns. They decided to use today as a visiting day to look at what upliftments these parks will need. They realized that the town council do need funding and we do have a bit of funding aside as well to, up, to uplift these parks and playgrounds. So today we have the Child Advisory Board along with um, five members of the Technical Steering Committee which includes uh, Corporal, Corporal Jones, who is uh, with us as well, ensuring that the children are being treated um, fairly and right. As well, we have the town councillors and the mayor. The mayor is very much um, attentive, listening to the children, and he's a part of this. Mayor of San Ignacio and Santa Elena, Earl Trapp, spoke about the number of parks that need to be restored. 90% of our parks need works at the moment, need some serious work. And um, like what Ms. Vanessa said, she are trying to seek funding and I can tell you that the council will do its part in financing some of these parks. We already began the process and um, we will ensure, like I said, um, we will ensure that our parks are, are being upkept for our children, for our youths and of course for visitors. A second form student at Sacred Heart College, Lamey Pot, is a member of the Child Advisory Board and she spoke on the importance of parks for the well-being of children. You have to take into consideration that there are children that are disabled. So that is one of the things that we will work on and try to improve the parks and also make them more child-friendly as to children. Because children don't necessarily want to see a park filthy, they want to see slides and they just want to see color around and they want to have fun as children and this is a big part of their development because they need to interact with others. This project is a part of the Child Friendly Municipalities project. A football coach is in Belize conducting training and coaching clinic for football players in the Cayo and Wantwalk districts. Andy Lyon, who is from Tallahoma, Tennessee, is an assistant coach for the Suwanee team at the University of the South. Lyon, who has been a coach for 15 years, spoke about what the objective of the coaching clinic is. 
The primary purpose is just to pass on um, just a few of the coaching and uh, education courses that I've been through. Uh, just I talked to uh, Mr. Cruz and we tried to set up some kind of kind of informal coaching education, just to take a few sessions and just to uh, just to discover for the coaches what's out there as far as education-wise, and just and for me to learn as well different cultures and um, and just take it all in as well. I started playing when I was probably two years old. Um, as soon as I could walk, I think my dad had a ball at my feet. Um, I've been coaching. I came to America, started coaching. When I was 22, so I've been coaching for the last kind of 14, 15 years. I coach different age groups, anything from four and five years old to kind of 18, 19 year old players as well. Um, I used to play on local teams and then uh, at Leeds University as well. A coordinator of the training sessions is former executive member of Federal Football of Belize, Cruz Gamez. He spoke about how the sessions will benefit players. Well, Adventure Sports Club is a club that not only engages in the participation in tournaments, but we also um, engage in the educational aspect of this of football. Um, we invited Mr. Andy Lyon here because we see the necessity of having um, coaches' education. I think we need to work a lot with our coaches so that they can improve themselves and thereafter they can. Um, help the kids in their development of football. I think with hard work, with the effort being put by um, coaches, I think we can improve. What we need to do is to organize ourselves better, put our um, some priorities in place and put some, um, especially in the youth division, put some requirements, some recommendations on, on our way forward so that everybody can follow that one um, philosophy. If we do that, well, then I think we can um, improve a lot in our sport. Over the weekend, there was a celebration of Dangriga Day with a municipal fair. The two-day event began with a motorcade on Saturday morning starting at Ecumenical Junior College to the BTL Princess Royal Park. The opening ceremony started off with a cultural group performance. The fair was celebrated under the theme celebrating 121 years of productivity and progress. Several organizations were involved in the fair, including NEMO, Courts, Oceana and National Health Insurance. Activities included beach volleyball and football, cultural entertainment, kayak racing, boat rides, a mechanical bull, and a dance for high school students. The fair took place at the Why Not Island. The fair was organized by the Dangriga Town Council. Our thought conditioner for today comes from Sophia Lauren. It reads, quote, There is a fountain of youth. It is your mind, your talents, the creativity you bring to your life and the lives of people that you love. When you learn to tap this source, you will truly have defeated age. End of quote. This has been the Evening News on Love Television, and we invite you to log on to our website at www.lovefm.com for transcripts of our news stories. We'll leave you tonight with the performance of Shine Poe Barrow at Friday night's Bad Boys Reunion concert held at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York. We thank you for joining us. Have a safe and enjoyable evening and enjoy the performance. I am Taryn Butcher. Makes some noise. Congratulations. 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 Congratulations.